I'm going to look at more of our uh, Anuadatawa project, which we call We Will Govern. Before I start with that, I'll give you a little bit of history of, of myself. Uh, so in 2015, I, did, I decided to run for the elected position of a district chief in my community. Prior to that, I was an employee with the Mohawk Council for 27 years. I, I was successful, obviously, in that bid, but um, when I took office, I found it difficult that I didn't have any real guidance on what I needed to do as a leader and how I needed to serve a community of 12,000 plus um, members, 8,000 of them still on reserve. Uh, I, I was kind of lost at my responsibilities. Fortunately, I was able to, a friend of mine had um, introduced the Indigenous Policy and Administration course to me and reviewing the outline and the programming and, and um, I became interested in taking that course and I took all six courses within the year on a part-time basis because I felt that that would help me understand my role as a leader. I chose to, to build the capacity of myself and offer that to my community. So when we talk about capacity building, that's, that's also an, when we want to look at our community as a whole, we have to look at ourselves as well. Um, I would encourage any leader to take these courses because it helped me understand areas of financial management, Indigenous and Canada relations, numerous other areas that sometimes I would just look at it and say, oh, okay. But now I can sit in a meeting with auditors and ask them about the bottom line. How did we get that? Why does that number look like that? What does that mean for the rest of the budget? When there's risk, there's, there could be general assessment risk. Now I can say, oh, I know what you're talking about and ask questions to it. So my presentation today is, gonna, is more or less gonna go around a lot of the questions and comments I heard over the last 24 hours or so. Um, I think that, uh, when we talk of self-government, self-determination, we have to look to us, each community in a different way. I mean, you can definitely look to build a template to do that, but we don't fit in templates. We know that. We have to, we have to look at the wants and needs of our community. We have to go back to our history. We need to know where we came from before we can decide where we're going. So for us at, at Aquasasne, we have three districts. Our council is based of 12 chiefs plus a grand chief. We elect four chiefs per district in a three-year term. We have our own election law. We have our own membership code. We decide who our members are. We decide how our elections will play out. We took that away from the Indian Act years ago. I think it was in 87 and 88. So we govern ourselves on that. Every three years we have an election. Um, the age limit for an individual to be eligible for a candidate is 18. So when we talk about engaging our youth, we're engaging them here. We don't get many that young because of course on the other hand people may think oh, they don't have enough life experience to, to be taken on such a role. So, but we have that there. We have, we have the ability to have someone in office that young. I think our youngest member was actually 19. So it can be done. So for us at Aquasasna, we have two provinces. We have Quebec, where two thirds of my community sit, and one of which I represent, and we have Ontario. To go between those t um, three districts, we must go through the US. We are landlocked by the United States. In our Ontario district, if you want, uh, which is an island, if you choose to leave it, if you go one way, you're going through US border. If you go the other way, you're going through the CBSA, Canada border. To go beyond that, when I leave for work in the morning, I leave Quebec, drive through to New York State, and drive back into Quebec. I don't hit a border station. A lot of our economic development struggles through that as we cannot both all three of our districts are off the main strip of the U.S., so we don't get flow to traffic of our territory. We have three governments in our, in our territory. We are the Mohawk Council. We are governed through uh, Canada. 
We have the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, who is the U.S. portion. And we have the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs, with, which our traditional people follow. Um, I would say quarterly we have what we call leadership meetings to discuss issues that affect us at, um, as a community and not as a government. We try to, to share our resources, however, that's very limited when you're reporting back to um, your funding source. We do like 80, 80 audits a year on any piece of little bit of funding we get through Canada requires an audit. We do not see the funding to, to pay for those audits. So it becomes difficult for us. So part of our negotiations with the Anuadatawe, um, the process took many shapes and forms over the years. We signed our agreement in principle in 1999, and we've been moving forward since. We're looking to redefine our working relationship with Canada. The agreement is not with INAC, it is with Canada. So we have pulled in different areas, Health Canada, Environment Canada, uh, Transport Canada. We, have, we also have them coming to our table to have discussions on, on our final agreement. So what we're looking for is to expand our jurisdiction and authority. And during, so for us, we've had different management of this program. And one of the things that happened over the years is one, one manager might say, well, we're opting out of the Indian Act, and that caused a great deal of fear in the community. You need to be sure of what you're communicating to your people. You need to be able to sit down and consult with them before you, you even want to engage in this process. They need to understand what it'll mean for them. So we had to go back, we had to take a step back and, and go and share some consultation, some information sessions with them so that they could understand that we're not looking to opt out of the Indian Act. We're looking to gain the jurisdiction and the recognition of our authorities that we have already. So for us at Akwazasne, the Indian Act is, controls about 71% of our affairs and we control the other 29. And as I mentioned, we have our membership code and we have our election law that we've taken from there. But we also, since 19, I believe 1985, we've had our own education system. We, we administered ourselves. We have three district schools for our elementary, and one of them is for Ganyakeha, which is our Mohawk language. It's fluent from when you walk in the door to when you leave. We have the post-secondary administration on, as we administer that, so that's part of our school board. We have our own school board. We manage the, our non-insured health benefits. We have our own ethical conduct law that our council is governed by. We have a Mohawk court. We have a Mohawk court law. We have our own restorative justice program that we have, in, I believe in the last eight, nine years, we've really been improving the services that over the years that um, we're looking to not only be working with our youth there, but now to incorporate our, our, our adults based on getting our community laws enforced. Uh, we have our own policing. We have our, our administration where we, we have our own internal policies to our general personnel policy, to health services policy, to child and family services policy, everything we govern and administer on, on, on our reserve has a policy, has procedures. We, um, what Akwazasne wants out of this agreement is we want to have recognition of that jurisdiction and those authorities from Canada. And we want to be able to govern our lands and our estates. Right now, Canada does that. And part of, as we spoke yesterday when we talked about the difference between the First Nations Land Management Act and the land code, we are already in the process of our land code uh, negotiations. We prefer that we stay in that venue versus going to the First Nations Land Management Act. That act is done, you follow that. For us, we want to create what we will follow. And one of the things in there is that INAC will keep 
and, have, and keep and must settle all the land disputes they've created by their lack of ability to deal with the situations. On our community, there's 200 plus land disputes. A lot of those come out of estates that INAC failed to settle. So we will not inherit that. That's part of the negotiations. We are working on a step to, to continue to maintain our Aboriginal rights. We're redefining our relationship with Canada. Canada's responsibility will ensure their fiduciary relationship will continue. Part of that, they will not be able to include any of our land claim settlements in their fiduciary responsibilities that will be held separate as part of the negotiations. We've spoken many times of the need for them to change their financial management policy, and I know that most of you are probably aware of that, that that's ongoing right now. We, in meetings with Aquas Austin, we had said that own source revenue needed to remain our own source revenue because in agreement they look to take it off the bottom line after a certain amount of years. Well, that can't happen. We've told them that many times we pay for the services that they don't provide, which they are responsible to provide with our own source revenue. That needs to stop. You need to um, provide us the funding that we will require to take over these jurisdictions and to properly provide that. So with the financial, manage, uh, financial policy being re re reviewed, I'm sorry, being reviewed, um, those working on their final agreements were not gonna be part of those discussions. We pushed to be part of it because we're, we're, we're gonna be governed by it. So they finally let us in and we're, we've been bringing our concerns to the table. My community struggles with economic development. We don't have fisheries, we don't have um, um, mining, forestry, we, we, we don't have that. So we've been pushing in an area to share for the revenue sharing of, of the resources that Canada gets when they make deals upon deals with Industry Canada. Canada gets the benefit of that, we don't. We have ships going through our territory, we have erosion to our lands, we don't see any compensation to it. One of the areas we've also spoke to in, in our, our um, agreement was the expropriation of land. Uh, for us, it's no. There'll be no more expropriation of our land. They expropriated, I want to say, once, around 60 years ago, where the Seaway Dam came in and they flooded our islands. So we've, been, we've gone through a settlement, and part of that settlement included the return of islands. Well, according to Canada's ATR policy, that's, that settlement's 10 years old now, and we've not seen the return of those islands. So how can we bring a final agreement to our community with those words saying you can expropriate our land and you expect it to be a, a, a accepted? We told them that it might as well just kill this whole the work we're doing right now because our community will not accept that again. It was pushed on them. They didn't have a choice. You took what you wanted based on your Indian Act. So we have, we've been working in an area that every time we sit at the table, we take, think of those seven generations ahead of us. We think of how it affects them. We think of what it's going to do for them. At the same time, you have generations behind you that went through it all. You have to go back and find out how it affected them, what it meant to them, what the future should look like, what their experiences were, what can they tell you to help you when you're negotiating. You have to know the history. We at our tables, we have four tables, and each one of those tables has a youth member, has an elder, has a community member where we can engage all levels of ages in our table so that we can sit and hear what they have to say. They tell us what they know. We engage them. And it is hoped that through that they're sharing with their family, with their relatives, and we're getting our, we're getting our um, process out to the community. So 
For us, where our phase one is our governance and relationship final agreement and our sectorial agreement. The governance and relations agreement is what Canada and our recognize our jurisdictions and our authorities. The final sectorial agreement will list our jurisdiction set out by the, by the exercise so that we can do our lands, our education, our health, our school boards, and, we, and define our jurisdictions and how we will play that out. So when we create those laws within our community, it will replace the Indian Act. So we're moving in that fashion. I would really love to just to have it all done before the agreement's done, but we kind of don't have the money to do that, nor will they give that to you. <laughs> so one of the other, we want the, the last one is the fiscal relations agreement. And at one point, they said, well, you know, we can do that, doesn't have to go to the community. And we said, no, it will go to our community. Their fear is that we won't have the funding to sustain us if we go into a, an agreement and that we need to prove to them that we will. So the, the fiscal relations agreement will also go to the community for their consideration. It'll be a vote for us to know whether they want us to go forward. It doesn't necessarily have to be with Canada's knowledge, but we need to, to be transparent. We need to be accountable. And that's how we plan to do that with the fiscal relations, because it's a fear. It's a real fear in our community. We won't have enough to sustain. They don't trust Canada. Why should they? You know, we, we've been struggling through a lot of our, a lot of our um, delivery of services to our community because of funding. We have a budget that is over our, uh, 100 million but we have a community that we must triplicate services to. So when we're trying to keep those services going, we're going into our own source revenue. We've told Canada we need that back. You know, we shouldn't be doing that now. How do we ever get ahead of ourselves if you plan to take that off the bottom line of, a, of an agreement once we're seven years in? That should stay with us. That belongs to us. We own it. So we speak to things like that at our table. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you what you would put in your agreement, but you need to go to your community and find out what they what their wants are. They have to be engaged in this before you even get started, because it's very difficult to go back and get their support later. So when we when I became. When I became a council member or chief, that I had a lot of issues of concern when I wanted to know what my roles and responsibilities are. How do I, how do, I do this job? The orientation was just telling me what my departments had, what their budgets were, and what their concerns were. That really didn't help me. So I pushed for our council to create a, a governance committee, just an internal small committee. And that committee is now working on what an orientation should look like for a new council member or any council member. And that includes knowing your roles and responsibilities, knowing Canada, know what the relationship is between your council and Canada, some financial management to know what you're looking at when you're trying to look at audits, when you're looking at a budget, when you're trying to make decisions on that. You need to know a little bit. I didn't. I thought I knew enough being an employee for 27 years. Different side of the table, different, <laughs> different, all totally different. So if we can, you know, and to me that's building my capacity of my leaders, my new leaders that will come in in 2018. You're giving them a, an adequate jump start to what they need to do instead of spending six months to a year learning that in a three year term. You're not being very effective that way. Uh, one of the things I, I learned in, in uh, my courses here at Carleton in the financial management program is, is working on policy, um, proposal writing and development. You know, for a leader, I wouldn't have to do that, but I would, I would like to be part of it when, when it's something I, I see as initiative. And um, one of the reasons I became a member was because we had issues, I had issues with our community laws and the lack of enforcement of it, and I'm, I'm sure we all may have that issue. So what I did is, um, after our, my classes here, I started, every one of my courses here, I took it, and I took an issue from my community, and that's what I wrote on. And I, it was very easy to do after that. The, ref, the reflections just came out. And I wrote a proposal for a compliance pro unit 
that I saw going under my policing unit as three tier. And I actually got that idea from my chief of police. I won't say that I did this myself. I mean, reach out to your resources and use them because they gave me a lot. I went to my director of uh, justice who, who was actually the supervisor for two compliance officers in a community that spread in three district, 8,000 8, plus members and travel between the U.S. and, and uh, Canada, all of our waters. It was just not doable for us to feel confident that our laws were being enforced. We created that proposal. We went to INAC. They, well, they came to us, then they asked us to go back because they said there was such a passion in what we wanted to do. Today, we can, we will, we're working on a pilot project with them that would allow us to train 10 individuals as compliance officers, five from our community, and we will, we will reach out for five from other First Nations. We're going to look at creating, we have a 13-week project that will see them come out as qualified compliance officers to enforce the, their community laws. We're taking that, our unit, our next is getting funding for our unit, and that'll go under policing where law enforcement belongs. It goes back to building the capacity in your community. We struggle right now to fill the seats of our constables. So if we have compliance here, they have law enforcement experience now, they can apply to become constables and we can, we can um, fill the compliance positions. So we're building our capacity. We're looking at how to do that to take care of the need of our community. We're hoping that we will have this up and running by January. If it's successful, INAC is looking to continue the project. So when we look back at, I heard a lot of um, comments yesterday about how do we be prepared? You know, what do we do for our community? Um, how do we know what we're looking at? When can we, when can we engage this? Who do we engage with? One of the things I know I found is that I had to build a network. I had to reach out to, to areas where I knew that I needed their help. I couldn't do anything alone. So build networks. Look for, for communities that are, that are similar to yours that have started the process. Um, work with them, ask questions, find out who can help you. I find that um, communication is huge. You need to not only communicate with your members, but your council, your employees, uh, and the government. I know that people think that, or we all think, let's face it, that they're just bad. But we have to, in order to move forward, we have to do, we have to accept the task. At some point, the glass must be half full. We need to get beyond the past in order to move forward. We constantly talk, and I, I mean no disrespect, I, but we need to say, okay, the past is the past. We do need the history for what we need to do, but we can't dwell in it anymore. We need to move forward. So when I look at the challenges for our community, um, I find that a lot of it is the trust factor and the fear. We need to, the fear is that if we accept this agreement with Canada, we won't be sustainable in, for our funding. So on the other hand, I'm telling my community, we need to start looking at some economic de development ventures. We keep, it keeps coming to the table. We gotta pay attention to it now. We have to see what it can do. Because we can't just take this and expect it. This funding is going to sustain us we're capable of finding other ways to add to that. Um, so when we talk about the budget, every year with INEC, because this is an ongoing process, we have to submit a budget to INEC for this process, then we wait for approval. Only now have they finally changed it to a two-year process. Yay. But it, it becomes tedious when they want this probably more than we do. Um, Minister Bennett had said at, at numerous meetings that it would be great that if all First Nations could be self-governing, then they get rid of the middleman and we're not waiting for INAC to go through all these budgets and give us approval when we're six months into the fiscal year. 
uh, and then take it back when it's not spent because it's too late to spend. I, I, you know, that's that's a big, uh, big statement to make when there's some of our First Nations that may not be ready for it, but you're going to push them in that avenue. You, they need to step back and look at the type of assistance they're going to give these First Nations that aren't ready because it's a big leap. We've been doing it since 1999, and we may be in our final, final push by 2019. So that could take 20, this is a 20 year process for us. Um, like I said before, know your history, know where you're coming from and what lies there and where you want to be. Educate, educate your people. Make sure they know the process, make sure they're included in the process. Make sure you hear their voice when they're talking to you and telling you what their needs are. It's, it, you know, when, when you include people, when you hear them, it's, you know, you have a better chance of them accepting the outcome. Because if you're not, then they don't want to hear what you have to say. And they will tell you that too. <laughs> so when I spoke of the funding, um, you got to make sure those assurances are there. So for us at Akwazasne, um, we have created a law enactment process. And that process allows us to develop our laws. So from that, we're able to develop. We have a Mohawk court where we can adjudicate. Now we're working to build our community law enforcement so we can enforce those community laws. That, I think, in itself is one of the biggest struggles for our own community. We can develop laws, but when we're responsible for enforcing them, we kind of look away a little bit. Because if it affects you or your family, you don't want to push the button to say, um, you got to leave. We're looking at the big cannabis law that's coming down in July of next year. You know, how do we deal with that? For my community, it's a, going to be a nightmare. When I have two provinces in Quebec, and the way you get through them by land is through US, don't. Health Canada sit in front of me and say, you can call your order in and we'll ship it. You can't ship it to those districts. To import into the U.S. is a federal offense. To drive through with it is a federal offense. So what does that create for my two districts to do? Now we're sitting at the table having to figure out how we're going to do this. <clears throat> we're creating our own law. We will create our own regulations to to ensure that it's not abused in our territories or it's, you know, that we have some control of it. So when I go back to saying I need a compliance program to enforce these laws, I need a compliance program to enforce these laws. And you most likely will too if that's what you look to do. Um, so, and we have our own Mohawk court. Right now we're working with, uh, we have a multi-jurisdictional table that includes the provinces and the feds so that they will recognize our court and that we can have our, not only our community laws, but some of our of the other laws that are in the Indian Act be heard in our court, be adjudicated in our court and enforced in our court. The consequences would come into our restorative justice program. So Provinces of Quebec and Ontario have a hard time releasing those authorities to us, but we're working on it. We're hoping that uh, soon, rather than later, that we'll get those jurisdictions. So I, I know I went around different areas here, but I'm hoping that um, I provided you a little insight to where Akwazasna is with their self-government, self-determination agreement, and that it won't be a quick process. Uh, I can't go into much more detail of where we are and how we're, we're doing, um, but a lot of those f finite agreements have already been made, but uh, I'm hoping that from this you, you get an understanding that, first of all, you have to start with your, your own community. You need to understand their needs and their wants and the history before you can go out and tell Canada what you want. And it will be what Canada, it shouldn't be what just INAC. Thank you.
I, I did just want to show you a couple. This is um, a pl uh, educational tool that, that, that the program created themselves. And all it is is it goes through um, a quick um, about us, the Indian Act, why are we negotiating, recognition of our rights, Anawadatawa process, 10 things you should know about Anawadatawa, Anawadatawa timeline, agreements and codes, Anawadatawa and the Mohawk Council of Akwazasne. This is what we're providing to our community We've given that to them in the mailing process. We've had educational meetings. We have focus meetings with them as well. This is the start to letting them know this is where we're headed, our, our progress from, from the meetings and what's happening. The Indian Act, what we did from here is we took the Indian Act and it lists what that is and then it lists on a side of what Anawadatua, our nation building process as our community sees the change should be. This is also provided to our community so they can see what the Indian Act is and the potential of what it could be for us or what we see it to be. So though it's been a long progress, we're hoping that this information is good for our community and, and we get a lot of feedback on it because now they're saying, well, what does this mean? You know, so we're, we're engaging them. They're talking to us, they're telling us they have questions and it's an excellent educational tool for them. Thank you.